Thanks, Shiva. I was just trying to get to know who all are there in them. You are all students of the final year, first year. How is it? First year. So you've just started studying your graduation. Great. So let me tell you a little bit about who we are, because then that will help set context about whatever it is that I'm going to speak about. I'm from a group called Biome. How many of you are from Bangalore? There are some of you. And how many of, let's say very simply, from the north, maybe? Northern states. And how many from the south? It's a large number. And from east, West Bengal, Bihar, Odisha, none. And from the west, Rajasthan, Gujarat, very few. So I think we have a, a predominant number of people from the south. Uh, the reason I'm saying this is because we're going to be speaking about groundwater. And strangely, the ground below each of our feet in different parts of the country is quite different. And the study of that is, of course, called geology. And we'll go more about that. So as an organization, Biome, we started pre-2000, the year 2000. And it was a group of people. The city of Bangalore, for instance, gets its water from very far away, from the river Kaveri. And that flows at, a, at almost 100 kilometers uh, away from the city and it's half a kilometer below the elevation of Bangalore. So it's 500 meters below the elevation of Bangalore. And a lot of energy, close to 40 megawatts of power is what is spent to pump the water from the river to the city. Most cities get their water from rivers, right? Is that how they get their water? And normally the rivers are far away from the city. Why is the river far away from the city? Yeah, because as it comes closer to the city, we start to contaminate it. So you get cleaner water when you're further away from the city. The challenge with Bangalore was that it had to be pumped through a height because Bangalore is at an elevation and it had to be pumped through a distance also. So then the real question was, while water is available, but do you really have to get water from so far away? Do you have to pump it from a river so far away? And if you don't have to pump it from so far away, what are the sources of water that are available right where you are? which are some of the sources. So if I'm standing here, what might be the easiest source of water for me? Any of you? Groundwater is available to me, right? Groundwater is available and also rainwater is available. And that's how our group really started, saying that groundwater is available to me, rainwater falls right on top of my head. Do I really have to go that far away and get water for myself? And if you really look at it, that's how it has been with civilizations also. Initially, as civilizations came about, they settled near the river. Why did they settle near the river? Because they had access to water. But what is the problem with settling near a river? You can have floods. So when you have floods, you lose all your belongings. What do you do? Then you move away from the river. Then how do you make sure water is available to you? You dig structures, which are wells, which go into the ground and access the same water that's available to you. And it, of course, works differently. So with some of those thoughts in mind, we register, we kind of were a group of people who called ourselves the Rainwater Club. Uh, we used to implement rainwater harvesting, which is again a topic by itself in, in small homes, in farms, in campuses, incidentally at this campus also. So we, and which is why it took some time to look around to see what's happening with the rainwater harvesting here. So we design and implement rainwater harvesting systems, wastewater treatment systems. We do water audits, lake conservation. The whole idea is anything to do with water, how do you do it as sustainably as possible? And the whole idea is how do you keep the footprint as low as possible? That means you're not going very far out to bring water, you're not going very deep down to bring water. You try and look at resources that are available to you and you're not spending a whole lot of energy to get this water for yourself. Okay, with that concept, we kind of came up with a group. Ours is a group of, we are about 15 people now who work on water. Initially, some of us were engineers because we thought you need engineers to figure out how systems work with water. Then we slowly start, now we have social scientists, doctors, because if you look at water, water quality, what, what, what impact does water quality have on health? How does it work with nutrition? Then you need to know, uh, how do you take these messages across to schools and children? So you need people from all disciplines to be working on water. So today I thought this is uh, somewhere, this is something that we made some time back and uh, we are launching a campaign in Bangalore which is called A Million Wells for Bangalore. And if you look at, since I asked you which parts of the country you all are from, we'll just take a look at some of these images. These are some of the oldest wells that are there in the country from the Indus Valley Civilization, from even earlier. 
and we see that this used to be a source of water. And just so that we know what are all the sources of water that we have now? Where, where do you get water from? Somebody from here? Where do we get our water from? From rainwater, yes, then? Sorry? Rivers, okay. Ponds, okay. Groundwater, somebody said. And how deep do we get our groundwater from? And what are those wells that go deep down called? Bore wells. Have you seen how water comes into a bore well? Do you know? Like how deep do we go? The deepest bore wells are about 2000 feet deep. Can you imagine how deep, like if this building is, if we were to assume that it's about 30 feet tall, so how much? 60 times that. That's how deep the bore wells go and that's where you're getting your water from. So obviously it's not recent water, it's water that's gone down very many years ago. If we keep pulling water out from there, more than likely that it's going to run out. So we need to recharge and because all those messages. But the reason we're speaking about open wells is this seems to be a very simple way to be able to access water. It's easy to recharge it. It's easy to extract from there so, because it's available at a level from where you can easily extract it. So this is a picture from Kolar. I think so who spoke here before was from Kolar. This is adjacent to a lake. It's a very beautiful well. It's right next to the lake. The advantage with having the well there is that even if your lake water is contaminated at times, because the soil acts as a filter, the well is often able to access clean water. So we just look at a few images from there. And these are the things that we'll be talking about. So this is again, have any of you seen structures like this? You have? Okay. Because, I mean, it's quite hard to kind of get to see them in the city. You normally end up, though we have seen many more in Bangalore subsequently, but what it allows for you to do is access groundwater uh, at a level that is comfortable for you. So, of course, wells may have water at 20, 30, 40, 50 feet deep, and then you may have to put a motor, but largely those structures are called open wells from where you could even mechanically put in a bucket and have a pulley and pull out your water. That structure is an open well. A bore well on the contrary is normally six inches in diameter, goes very deep down and you have to have a motor with which you pump the water outside. Okay, And uh, the water that comes to this well is from the aquifers which are shallow and it's called unconfined because it's open to atmospheric pressure. It's, it's very much like when you go to a sea beach. Even when you're far away from the sea and you dig a small hole, water comes into that hole, right? Some of you may have seen that. The reason it comes there is because water is available everywhere. The moment you dig this hole, this water is accessible to you. So that's one of the wells. And uh, perhaps that's the whole messaging to say that this was the once you invented the well, you knew that you were not tyrannized by the river. Uh, by the river. You didn't have to worry whether there's drought or whether there's flood and you always had access to fresh and clean water. Yeah, and mostly wells were used for irrigation. If you look around, drinking water wells are different from irrigation wells. And as people started building wells, they tried to make them more artistic as well. So this is a well in Hampi. Uh, we'll see more images of that. The whole idea is the same, that you're able to access water. But the question is, how do you go down? How do you get water? That's what the emphasis has been on. This is from Dolavira in Gujarat. Uh, again, in the Sali civilization. And the water, it's surprising that in Gujarat, which otherwise has a water problem, these places that have been desertified, there is water that is still available in this and that's how old the oldest wells that have been found. That is 3,300 years ago. That's how old these wells are. And uh, that's from Sarnath. And it's easily 500 BC. We sometimes think, and I heard Sir here speaking about Gautam Buddha. Did Gautam Buddha drink from the same well that people now can drink from? Because the well is still there. It's from the time of Gautam Buddha. There is water in the well and people actually drink it. So these, these are really ancient water holding structures that are available to us. Uh, that's the Vijayanagara well in Hampi. 
And what is, let's say if we take a well and a bore well, what are the differences that you can think of between an open well and a bore well? Yeah, it will be large in diameter, bore well may be narrower. Normally, it's about 6 inches, 8 inches in diameter. That's a good difference. Any other difference? It goes deeper and it normally, and we'll see a small video about how water comes into a bore well and how it comes into an open well because it takes water out from deep rock. The water actually comes from very, uh, there are cracks and fissures that are present in the rock and that's how water really comes into the bore well. What else? What does it, does a, how do we connect with a well and you know, how many of you have actually drunk water from a well or seen a well other than these images? That's good, that's a large number of you. And where have you seen these wells? Sorry? In? In Adal, okay. And then? At a more local level in your homes or neighborhoods, have you seen them or in archaeological sites? You've seen them, right? Yeah, okay. Okay. Hmm. So what are the other differences? Can you see, if you look into a bore well, can you see the water? No, but if you see, look into an open well, you can see the water. What is the difference there? Because you can see when the water level is coming up and when it's going down. When it's gone down, you know that not that much water is available. So you kind of regulate your water consumption also. Whereas in the bore well, when it stops yielding water, you don't know what the reason is. Is it because there's no water available? Is the pump not working? We often do not know. So what we say is that an open well talks to you, whereas a bore well does not really talk to you. It's not really telling you anything about what's happening inside the bore well. Anything else? Water quality? Have do you all know anything about what happens to bore well water quality? Okay, better as in what? What's okay? Do some of you agree with that? That that's a valid point. Yeah. Yeah, so is, is it right to say deep bore well water is cleaner than open well water? So I'll just elaborate on that. What really happens is that deep bore well water, because when you go do so deep down into the ground, there are geogenic causes. Naturally in the soil, there are fluorides and there's sometimes arsenic that's present in the east zone. That's a big problem. So the moment you go deep down into the ground, there are minerals that are present which dissolve in this water over a period of time. So typically, bore well water is much harder. That means it has lots more salts. For all practical purposes, it looks fine. But when you drink it over a period of time, there are very many harmful effects that can be there because of bore well water. On the contrary, open well water is softer because it's fresh water that's just recently gone into the ground. However, if there is any sewage contamination, let's say there is a pit that they, that's carrying sewage, that bacteriological contamination can come into the open well as well. So both of these have their own challenges in terms of how you maintain it and how you use it. But both have the capacity to have good as well as bad quality water. And in fact, it's uh, interesting to note that uh, uh, are you all aware that fluorosis is a big problem in the country? What happens when you get fluorosis is that your teeth turn brown, your bones turn weak and you are not able to walk and move around. The cases can be really severe and this is there in northern parts of Karnataka, Andhra, even Madhya Pradesh, wherever water is got from deep water sources. And this is, the reason this happened was initially and even arsenic in water can cause cancer. So initially across the country, even till 1960s and 1970s, people used open wells for water. And like she said, as the open wells started to get contaminated with bacteriological contamination, from UNESCO, they sent three borewell rigs to India to dig borewells to take deep water out from the ground. But as they got deep water out from the ground, initially those bacteriological diseases went away. But now over a period of time, they figured out as because of taking this water out, what's happened is this arsenic and fluoride has come out from very deep groundwater. And because you've irrigated with it or spread it on the surface, now those entire areas are contaminated with fluoride. So any source of water you pick, you get water of bad quality. So there are some challenges when we apply science and like when we go and at that time, nobody thought that water quality would be a problem. And the immediate problem was addressed. But subsequently is when they realize that these dissolved impurities which are already there in the water that can cause uh, harmful effects to health. So that's in uh, Patan in Gujarat. That's a very famous well. And like in, in that cases, they had these different levels. So you would record and say every year till what level did the water come up. So you'd exactly know if a previous year was a rainy year, was it a drought year, 
how much water really came into your well. Yeah, I <laughs> mean, right. And it, it also because of the way that it was structured, it was a community resource. And the thing with water also, groundwater, let's say if I dig and I find groundwater, does it belong to me? It doesn't belong to me, but can I use it? Can I sell it? You can't sell it? Do you, do you know people who sell tanker water? Or have you heard of that bore wells that, yeah, they extract from, so are they allowed to sell it? If I dug uh, below my house and I found some gold, does it belong to me? Yeah, it could, right? No, but really if you look at it, which is why water, ground water often goes to the department of mines and geology. They think of it as a resource that you're getting by mining from inside the ground. So ideally, it does not belong to anybody. It's a common pool resource. It, it is a resource that's available under the ground, shared to be shared by everybody, but to be managed by everybody. And that's very tricky when you imagine a city or a neighborhood or a country. In fact, as much as countries fight, countries or cities fight for river water like the Kaveri or other rivers that you've heard for, where there is battle, there, are, there is also battle for groundwater. So India and China, there's an aquifer that goes, there's groundwater below both the countries. So there is as much battle for the groundwater as much as for the surface water. Rivers are spoken about because that's more visible. The challenge with groundwater is that in, it's invisible. So most of the time you don't really know where is it, what's happening. And how to regulate it is also a very big uh, problem. I mean, it requires deep thought and implementation is very difficult. Yeah, so these are some of the names by which it's called in different parts of the country. Now, how do you construct some of these structures? And are, they, are there still people who can even construct them? Because it's very hard to really dig a structure of this size get stones if you want to make a structure that looks like this. And uh, very often they are really beautiful, you have these steps and they have made it so that people can go into the well and when the water level drops down, now of course you have a pump and you can see that uh, pipe that is going down, but you would be able to go down, bring the water up. And all of these, actually even around Hesarghatta, there is a tour that you are going out to, there are, there are wells in this area as well. So that's how, so you normally dig, when you find water then you stop digging and then you line these, why do you have to put this stone all around on the side, any reasons? What will happen if you don't put this stone? Water won't? No, water has to seep in, right, into the well it's kind of seeping in. So water will seep in, the moment you dig a hole, water will seep in. The, what's the advantage, if you didn't put stones, would it still be a well? Yes, it would be a well. Because water is coming in. You put these stones so that the soil doesn't collapse to provide structural stability. So you can do that in various ways, that's how it gets done. And sometimes when you dig, you actually hit rock at the bottom and you see, you'll actually see the water kind of come in through the cracks in the rock. And in a modern context, in a city, because you don't have that much space to be able to dig a well like that, that's how the well is dug. You dig a deep hole in the ground, you put these rings and then you put stones all around so that the structure does not collapse. Just a few, and it's also sad because many times when a well goes dry, people typically prefer to take out those stones and then they dump garbage into the well and they close the well because they say it's of no purpose to me because it's not giving me water anymore. So that's a well where the stones have been taken out and they're going to build something on top of it. So they're going to close it off. And uh, there are two types of wells, these, uh, this is how it was built earlier, that we will maybe watch a video. Uh, have you all seen a Persian wheel, a well one? Go back. Um, have you seen a Persian wheel or how that works or a real well that uses that? We will watch a quick video to see that.
So, I'm sure, have any of you all seen a structure like this? Yeah, and there are very few people now, this, as far as we know, because we work in this field, there's only one person who's even confident enough to make a structure like this, to be able to put those pulleys together and then to create that garland of buckets to be able to go down and get water. But just to show you, that's how an open well can also be. While it may seem very primitive, but there are certain advantages in extracting water, because what really happens is when we dig a bore well and we put a pump, do you know the rate at which it can pump water outside? There are several, I mean, depending upon the head, then there are several calculations, but it can give you easily 6,000 liters per hour and the extraction can be very heavy. You can run a bore well pump 24 hours a day and it will not, and it will continuously keep extracting water. What that typically leads to is there is automatically some kind of wastage that's built in, especially in the context of agriculture. But when you're kind of limited by slower practices, your extraction, you extract only as much as you really need because there's so much effort in extracting that water out. So many times it's useful to look at what we call as the water and energy nexus because in very many ways, by putting more energy, you might be able to get more water out. Yeah, by putting more energy, we didn't speak of it, but countries are desalinating water. You can go to the sea, pick its water, take out the salt, get that water alone. But that requires a lot of energy that, that goes into fetching that water. So every time we pick a source of water, it's useful to see how much energy goes into that water and how much does it cost. Uh, would you know, um, in a city when you buy water for every thousand liters from whichever is your city's utility, how much do you pay for water? Do you pay for water? We don't pay for water. Anybody thinks we pay for water? Okay. Uh, in most of the country, in most of the cities in India, people pay some kind of 200 rupees in the entire year. And they don't really pay based on how much they use. Electricity do we pay for? Yes, right? Every month you get an electricity bill, you know how much you've used and how much you're paying for. In Bangalore, for every thousand liters of water that the government gives us, it's, it's an authority called the Bangalore Water Supply and Sewerage Board, we pay six rupees for thousand liters. And when we buy it from a private tanker, anybody knows how much it costs? It costs 100 to 125 rupees per thousand liters. Okay? And when you take it out from a bore well, it costs you about 18 rupees per thousand liters. And when you take it out from an open well, why do the costs vary so much? And from an open well, it costs you about 3 rupees per thousand liters because you're spending lots lesser energy to get this water. And when you get rain, harvested rainwater, you spend no money at all. It comes to you for free. So the choices that we make, whether it be for water or whatever else it may be, can we look at those sources that are low on energy? You can go back to the question. Okay, let's actually play one more video. water enters into a bore well from a fissure, it's a horizontal fissure. The depth is around 180 feet in a granitaceous area. The camera is being inserted into the bore well. And one can see the groundwater jetting in into the borehole. Hydrofracturing is done, these horizontal fissures will be opened up through injecting water under high pressure up to 3000 pounds per square inch pressure. These fissures are opened up. In combination with artificial recharge through rainwater harvesting, groundwater fissures can be developed as groundwater banks. fissures coming, horizontal fissures and more water coming in into the bore well.
really quite difficult to make these films also as the water there's water and there's depth there's pressure and then for the camera to continue to function That's really the bottom of the borewell. Yeah, where there's water that's always available. That which has fallen from on top. So normally you submerge your motor over there, and that's from where you start pumping. So that really was to show that there is there. It's really very delicate how the water comes into the borewell, and these are very small streams through which we are getting the water. Unlike an open well, which has access to lots more water, if it were managed well. Go back. Presentation. No further. No more. Yeah. So just a few images to say that urban wells end up looking like this, and. Uh, yeah that incidentally somebody was part of the groundwater subcommittee in the planning commission the earlier planning commission so th there are several people who are now across the country looking at how what all of you are aware right water is quite a big problem in the country itself and how to manage it especially groundwater how do you really put your mind into it and what are the solutions how do you manage groundwater better yeah, and that's where some of the stuff we spoke about that um, shallow water normally the water is always soft there is deep water the water is hard and then you can have these cementing and how do you extract water earlier people used to walk down go get it then you had centrifugal pumps which can't pump from great depths and then subsequently as we go deeper we have submersible pumps that are able to pump water even higher and normally what happens is these days if you have an open well that's gone dry people know that that's the place where you can strike water so they'll dig a bore well that's much deeper there and that's from where a lot of the water comes and how do we use this open well similar images only to show you it, it's still extracted like this with buckets and pulleys there's the persian wheel and that's what we saw and that's there across the world in certain parts but increasingly the usage is coming down so and there is a need for somebody to at least keep a, a few going so that subsequently if you ever want to resolve uh, were to resolve to animal and human power there is some device that is available and this, this since that was about uses of water still now when you go out into the countryside you would see images like this especially this summer uh, around devnahalli also and it needs a lot more confidence to swim in a structure like this than to swim in a swimming pool because here the depths are the wells are 30 40 50 feet deep and at any point that's the volume that's the column of water above which you are swimming but you still see children who pick up swimming very easily in these structures so as much as we need water for drinking and for irrigation we need water for fun and sports and other activities as well yeah and uh, that's another important use of the well that it tells us looking at the well water you can make out is it dirty is it clean how do you keep the neighborhood clean so th there are messages that come to us from there looking at the level of water you know how much water is available and what is it that you can do about that yeah 
and largely across the country now a lot of those images that i showed you also those wells you can see wells that are being closed down on a regular basis just because there's no more water available in them and what has happened is that as the shallow aquifer goes dry people are going more in search of deeper water and so these structures don't serve any particular purpose and uh, that's it. And so slowly you just take away the resources that are there, the stones, everything gets reutilized again. These are all again just images. And that's also something that we see very often. This picture just is even more, this, while there are people that are coming together to save their wells, often they become dustbins. So, and uh, there, there is a need for people to just be aware and imagine the number of kurkure packets alone that have gone into this well. So, and what else might you find inside that? So, we really have to see how we integrate these wells into our common regular life. So, now there are just a few examples of people who have come together and rejuvenated their wells. This is a particular colony on one of the roads in Bangalore uh, called Banarghata Road. And and men, because of real estate development, primarily these wells have gone in. Another thing that the well can be used for is rainwater harvesting. When you redirect water into the well, the water goes into the well and from the bottom it percolates out into the ground, recharging groundwater. This well is not very far from here, near the airport, Devanahalli. This is also, this is near a lake. And another thing that we often observe, there is a few uh, story books and uh, things which try to kind of make these concepts even more simpler and normally for still younger children is to see what are the relationships between surface water, groundwater, how when you have a lake, you can have groundwater available close to that. Yeah, These are all again instances of wells in Bangalore, near the police station and which are still being used. There is a Dhobi Ghat where people go to wash clothes in a very central part of Bangalore. There too, there is a well that has water and from wa where water is extracted and used to wash clothes. And uh, a few success stories of people who kind of come together and uh, try to revive their well and then where they are able to use water from the open well itself. Just a few images. These are all, especially for people from Bangalore, it may be familiar, but... Uh, this is in an area called Koramangla, which is again a central part. Most people think that water may not be available under the ground at such shallow depths, but water is. And then they use it. Uh, these are old open wells which have been closed down and then you desilt it. You find water and then it becomes a source of water. These are uh, software campuses now that because in Bangalore water since it comes from the river and is not often available, uh, you have to resort to your own, you have to kind of figure out where you get water for yourself. You might get it from tankers, people dig bore wells many times, the bore wells go dry, but there are open wells that software campuses have now dug where they find water and they are able to use this water for themselves. Once you test the water for quality and if you put it through appropriate treatment systems, so in a way we see these as the examples of where people have moved really ahead in technology, gone through the entire cycle of deep bore wells buying water, but now they are willing to go back to open wells as a source of water. Some of the reasons you all could kind of read it out yourselves. The fact that it lasts for so long, a bore well, it may yield today, may not yield tomorrow. We don't know how long that deep hole is really going to last. But these open wells, we've seen that they've lasted several centuries. This is also very local to what we do. And that's how the well is really dug. You start from digging from above. And then as you go deeper, sometimes you strike water, sometimes you don't. It's quite heavy work to lift those rings and those rings are lowered down all the way. And there is a group of four or five that work to build a, uh, a well and the rings are put so as to re reinforce the sides so that the water does, the soil doesn't collapse from the sides. And then you cover it from on top so that nobody is able, nobody accidentally or purposely is able to fall inside. Have you all seen there is a well on campus also? I just went around and there's, there's unfortunately just one single rainwater harvesting structure into which water is let in, which is not very deep, but it would have been much better had they dug the structure much deeper 
because in this area ground shallow ground water is available even though sometimes deep ground water is not available so these are all just images and about what you remember when you dig a well we can skip this and it's also very important to know how much water we are consuming do you know how much water a person consumes in a day anybody knows sorry 50 liters any others what all does that include 50 liters for ah, no it's more than that in urban scenarios each person is allocated 150 liters per person per day that includes your flushing drinking washing clothes washing vessels washing vehicles a little bit of uh, gardening then drinking and cooking all of those purposes put together in rural india each person is allocated 80 liters per person per day but in urban india you are allocated 135 to 150 liters per person per day but do you know how much if you really go out into houses and which are uh, if you look at the entire economic spectrum how much do you think people can go up how many liters per day is the richest man using say for instance in a house can you guess not the richest man but people who are making a fair bit of money how much water might they end up using per person per day it goes all the way up to thousand liters per person per day that can be the kind of water usage if it could be due to leakages it could just be due to, it need not be wasteful practices necessarily but it's just that you've increased your water demand simply because it's available and you're in a position to pay for it so as long as and what we think is responsibility is if you know how much you're taking out from the ground if you're able to put back an equal volume into the ground then perhaps you're responsible with your water use whether it's from the river or from groundwater that can be a guiding principle for responsibility in any context and these are the well diggers uh, you need very uh, kind of strong light men who are able to go in men and women there used to be women who used to dig wells till about 20 years ago and we've met many of them but for various reasons it's kind of become a man only industry but there are still stories that you encounter of women who've gone down 20 feet and dug a well for themselves but this largely comes from rural india uh, but in urban india most of the women and we've met a, it's very nice to interview these older well diggers who were women who've now given up the profession for various reasons uh, but it, it's a while it may seem like a skill that you really have to go in but as you go 20 feet or below the oxygen levels reduce so they carry a small kind of miners lamp and in the newspaper reports also often we get to hear of people who like went to dig a well or clean up it and for lack of oxygen died or collapsed right there so you have to be very careful in the way it is dug the people who do it regularly have make it seem like it's very easy but it really isn't and there's a community called the bovi community or manu Vadar, and those are the families that are able to do this and with digging wells the livelihood options are kind of going back to them because otherwise they had resorted to just digging foundations or they get other digging work across the city but now when you dig a well uh, they, they are also able to kind of track where water might be available and that's a whole different science by itself about how do you figure out where ground water is available so that's just several well diggers and families that still uh, are relying on open wells for water that's for uh, normally we use this for people who want to dig wells and it can also make for a picnic or for a bunch of people to go in and to be able to access the water in a well well is also not very far away from here so i think with that yeah these are all just examples of people who clean their wells and now in temples you often find wells that have water that's the dhobi ghat and that that community has a name too and this is a very interesting story of belgaum another uh, town in karnataka where they have revived many of their common open wells and instead of the river as a source of water the city supplies water from these open wells so that i mean that makes for a very good case study now there were 21 high yielding wells that they identified they fixed it and now the wells the water that they give is at 76 76 paise per thousand liters that's the uh, that's how cheap a price at which they're able to extract water. 
And this is an ancient well which gave water to Mahatma Gandhi. It was dug when the Congress party had a meet in Belgaum. They dug a well. It was called the Congress well. And that well is a source of water even now. And at that time it cost 4,000 rupees. And it's nice to see all these records that are maintained as well. This is just a few images again. That's it. With that, I shall close the presentation. That's our team. There are some more of us. Uh, you'll normally find us around lakes and wells and with well diggers. So, there are any questions or something else that you want to... There's some stuff here that you may want to take a look at. This is about Bangalore and its lakes and uh, how, why were lakes dug? What is it used for? How do you rejuvenate a lake? There's some information around that as well. And some small story books that have been written, you can take a look and post this. Thank you. Any questions? Or was it very boring and like went on and on? No, okay. Is there anything that you would like to ask or no? Or share maybe sometimes? Some of you who said you had wells, did they? Many times we hear stories of people who close their well or, or there is a turtle in the well, anything like that. Okay. Yeah, 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 sure, sure, yeah. Or any other questions around water for your own cities, rainwater harvesting, lakes, something like that which is of interest to you and you'd want to know more about, yeah. Aren't there, aren't there like uh, special uh, wells uh, allocated for uh, like uh, Ganesh idols being uh, immersed and all? Right. And, uh, also like, uh, what should be done for, uh, like, who to, what is an alternative for this thing to be stopped? For Ganesh idol immersion, yeah. So, see, Ganesh, that's that's there in this. Actually, more than a well, you often, uh, dis, uh, what do you say, immerse it in a lake. Here, you can also immerse it in a well. And what really happens, if it had been made only of clay, it would have dissolved and just sunk to the bottom and would not have made a difference at all. The challenge starts when there is POP, plaster of Paris, there's color, there's chemicals. And then when you put it into the, and then you've contaminated your water body. And then it becomes tricky for you to then maintain it. Right now, one of the things that's being done in Bangalore is that every lake, instead of, you don't allow people to immerse your idol in the lake, but you build a structure, it's called a Kalyani. That's really like a large pond, a lined pond, where water is pumped and kept in and people are allowed to, because they want to immerse in any case. And also what's happened is the number of idols have really increased. And you can't really tell people, while you can have rules from the government which says don't make it out of plaster of Paris, but you can't say you can't immerse it. So what we do is we build these other structures which are called Kalyanis, where people are allowed to immerse their, uh, and there are images in another presentation, which is really sad. There will be a Ganesha image, because what happens is in that Kalyani, you can only take a certain volume of idols. Once it fills up, you really have to have some kind of trailer that comes and it's almost like municipal waste that has to be picked and gone someplace else and dumped. So the thing is to make sure that the idols are not immersed in natural water bodies. Where we look at a well or a lake as a natural water body, you create a separate holding tank where you pump water, and there you allow for people to immerse their idols. And of course, that structure then has to be cleaned out. That's a challenge and there is no way around it. Does the well get water from below or side? How does a well get its water? From the sides? Okay, yeah, from the sides as well as from the bottom also. And when you, uh, yeah. Okay, anybody here knows or wants to answer that? How do you do rainwater harvesting? Okay, there are two, rain as it falls from the sky, is it clean? It's clean, right? It's distilled water. Where does it fall? It can fall on the roof, it can fall on the road, garden, wherever it falls. What falls on the roof normally is clean because if your roof is clean, you can filter the water store it and reuse it. 
There are filters that are available, but if you filter it, you can store it and reuse it. That's one form of rainwater harvesting where you're storing and reusing water. The other is water that falls on gardens and roads. What happens is that water won't stay clean because we're walking on the roads, there are vehicles on the roads. Yeah, there could be soil. That water can be used for groundwater recharge. And how do you use it for groundwater recharge? In a structure like that, if you put the water into that well, it will percolate out into the ground. And in the process of going into the ground, it will automatically filter out. So that's how you do rainwater harvesting. You either filter, store and reuse or you put it into the ground for groundwater recharge. Does that answer? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, so I did. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Goes into sewage or causes flooding. So you have this other challenge also that in the summer, and that's what that story talks about, that in summer you have no water, in the rainy season you're flooding. So it seems natural, I mean, it seems intuitive to think that science can somehow kind of close the loop together. So rainwater ha harvesting also helps reduce flooding in many cases. And uh, so that's where wherever this, because your surface gets harder, more water runs off. It either goes into the sewage drains, but that's quite a waste because here it's mixing with sewage. It's better if a city has separate drains for storm water. It's called a storm water drain in which only rainwater flows and sewage drains where only sewage flows. What happens to sewage? It goes to a sewage treatment plant. There's one here as well, if some of you have taken a look. The sewage gets treated, then it's used for gardening on this campus. About 30,000 liters towards that other one of the ends, there's a sewage treatment plant. But rainwater is, I'm sorry, next to the dining hall. Okay, that's where your sewage treatment plant. So as you'll roam around the campus, you can take a look at that. That water gets treated, comes back for watering the gardens, and which makes more sense because you don't need fresh water to water the gardens necessarily. And this water will also be of good quality. And rainwater runs in stormwater drains where you have only clean water. Ideally, it can go to a river or a lake or it can go into the ground for groundwater recharge. Right. Yeah, so that's a very, very important question. And uh, because let's say if I have uh, in this area, there's 17 acres, this is your campus. Yeah, so let's say 100 people were living on this 17 acres. And uh, each one, each of you had a house for yourself. And if you dug a well for yourself, and if you dug only one well to extract the water, do you think the volume of water would change? How much water you would get? I'll repeat the question. The 17 acres, let's say for simplicity, there's 17 houses. Each house has dug its own well and it's taking water out from the ground for itself. And if it's, if you're able to extract, say, 1000 liters per day, you're extracting 17,000 liters every day from these 17 wells. If I dug one well and extracted the same volume of can I extract the same volume of water out? No? Or yes? Is the question clearer? The real question is, again, coming back to why water is a common pool resource. So what we say is it's like a bank account. If 17 people take out the water also, it's the same water that's going to come out because it's from the same aquifer. Now, and you know how much it costs to dig a bore well these days? If it is going about 1,000 feet deep with motors, it can cost anywhere between 2 to 4 lakhs to dig a bore well. So if you look at it financially also, instead of 17 houses putting whatever, two, even if you take it at 2 lakhs or 4 lakhs, 34 to 68 lakhs, just to extract the water, by doing that, the total volume of water is not increasing underground. The only confidence it gives me is I don't have to depend on the other, my neighbor for water. I have my own well, I can extract it when I want. But typically what we've seen is when you do it that way, that gives rise to bad water management practices. So it's better if at a community level, there are fewer structures for extraction. So what do you do? You have these 34 lakhs anyway. Maybe you dig three or four common wells which extract water and give water out to everybody. So with the four wells, you've spent your 8 lakhs and 34 minus 8, your 26 lakhs are available, you invest that in groundwater recharge structures. And that's what when communities do, it displays for lots more wise water management. Where everybody invests money in groundwater recharge, few people, it's not few people, but they have to come together, form a community, extract it, and then manage the supply back to the individual houses. So in most communities now, what we say is that don't let every house dig their own borewell. Because one is the borewell is expensive to dig, 
or much lesser you can do recharge instead and even after you've dug your well there's your motor you there's maintenance that's involved and you have to pay for electricity so you don't want to multiply all of this this investment so it's a lot better of course at what scale do you do it like for the whole city can you have one bore well no so you have to decide what is a reasonable scale but certainly it doesn't make sense for each house to have its own extraction structure in an urban context in a rural context where people are living say five acres away very far away from each other that might be okay and where water is also required for agriculture and then that's different how much water for agriculture how to use it the different questions but it makes sense to manage water at a community level it's a community resource it's like air also we are all collectively responsible i may say theek hai i am driving my car doesn't matter but the air that i am contaminating is kind of gone for everybody else as well and hence it becomes very tricky to regulate ground water air how do you kind of make sure that everybody is responsible but some people are taking responsibility and how do you make sure everybody gets good quality water and good quality air these are the very basic needs that we require and they are really very simple but at the same time given all the things that we do in the modern urban world it gets a lot complex as well yes yes yeah so there are it's very strange there are a uh, have you all seen there are one is uh, called a well diviner what he does is that he'll either go with a coconut or two twigs have any of you all seen things like that where uh, so how do you divine water because from the surface uh this is even before science or technology as we know it comes in how do you figure out where there is water below the ground so there used to be methods like this they used to be and they still are so the people who call themselves water diviners and i've actually seen it work so it's quite tricky to imagine that you they they are not really faking it the, there are ways in which they are able to divine whether water is available below the ground or not that's one method there's another method that's called a vs vertical electrical sounding method what they do is they send a current uh, and at two points you kind of document the current and depending on the resistivity that you get based on the soil layers that you are able to identify you kind of estimate the depth at which you may be able to find water so people use these methods other than that there are satellite images sometimes which are able to give information on ground water but the surprising part is that all three work with equal rates of success and failure what i'm saying is this guy with the coconut or twigs he also finds it 50% of the time when you use vertical electrical sounding also it's 50% of the time so these are the ways that are commonly used but very often you can find it intuitively as you work on the field normally it will be in a lower lying area shallow ground water at 20 30 feet is easy to find but it's very difficult to say where at 1500 feet below ground level you are able to you're going to be able to find water but these are the ways that are adopted some more science and technology based some slightly mystical and some kind of science that we are not able to understand and some based on satellite imagery uh, but all of them are very tricky and in fact uh, people in the oil industry it's as difficult to find oil as it is to find water the only thing is because oil sells at how many ever dollars per barrel so the information that is available so if you for instance in water there is no database that's available which should be there for ground water everybody is digging bore wells across the city across the country but there is no consolidated data and every time they dig the bore well they know you saw the, that video where water is available which cracks are there if all that information could be collected and kind of visualized and understood there is a wealth of information that's available between all our homes and the bore well diggers about understanding ground water but that information unfortunately is not being collected put together or database made of it and understood but for oil because there's so much money involved there are companies that work on just collecting this data analyzing it and then predicting where what oil is going to be available so and because their rate of their cost for failure is much higher here you may 3 lakh seems like a large amount but 3 lakhs is an okay amount to dig and not be able to find water but for oil you just have to find water so what would really help and where science would help is if all this data could be put together and we are building a small platform in our own way where people can come together and you upload information about your well on the platform and then slowly over a period of time if enough people say i found water at 30 feet 1000 feet whatever in different parts of the city if you go back and look at the data you may be able to analyze and figure out how ground water is really available but that information at a country scale or at a city scale is not available currently
Okay, so what is the average cost required to purify seawater? You know, uh, if we succeed in doing that, all the water crisis will be solved. Ah. So what is the cost required to do that? Correct. So many times we think of cost as financial cost, right? How much money do you have to spend to be able to do that? Now, we just talk of desalination. What really happens is, uh, are you all aware of reverse osmosis systems for treating water? What does it do? Doesn't matter. Go ahead. Sorry. Yes. So what happens, supposing you have 100 liter, say you have 1 liter of water with uh, 1000 milligrams of some impurity in it. What you do is you are trying to take out at least, uh, you said 1 liter, right? So half a liter of water, which is much cleaner and this remaining half a liter, your 1000 milligrams of impurities will continue to stay. So what really happens at the end of any kind of filtration process is that you are left with water with lots more contaminants than, than was there in a larger volume of water. Now this volume of water, once you have it, what do you do with it, especially in the sea? They just put it out into the sea itself. They say already there's so much salt in the sea, let's put out this much saltier water into the sea. And over a period of time, what is observed is that it really kills out the marine life in that place totally because there are some natural balances that we don't fully well understand in terms of the fishes or other plankton and other small algae, other organisms that exist in the ocean and the sea to keep these balances going. So that's so that's just to say that, that there are multiple costs to it. But to very simply answer your question, it costs about 50 rupees per thousand liters to desalinate water. And the, these are called the ONM cost. That means the operation and maintenance cost. In, in addition to that, there is an infrastructure cost that you have to put to be able to build these plants. So that, that's the cost itself. But we think that because desalination you can look at in places where, so you, it's really a question of how much water do you want in which place. The challenge really starts that if you go to Las Vegas and which was not, which was a desert and then you want to build pools and fountains and lakes there, then you're obviously making an unnatural demand for water in a place where water did not exist. Then you have to look at ways like damming rivers or uh, desalinating water and then that has its own repercussions. So on the contrary, you can have your swimming pools and water fountains in where? In Cherapunji or maybe in Agumbe, those places that where water is available in abundance and you kind of monitor and regulate your water uh, uh, demand based on its availability. And if you were to do that, there is not, because if you look at the fresh water, that's normally where all these presentations start that in the whole world, there's three fourths of the world is made up of water, but most of it is sea water, very little fresh water is available. And then of that fresh water, how do you really manage it? So, so desalination, you can attempt it in cases where there really is no other source of water as long as we are very wise in how we use it. And that's why I brought up the borewell example. What happens is the moment we substitute, if technology becomes so easily available, we all resort to greater, the moment borewell is easy to dig and water is easily available, then we are not so frugal with our water demand anymore. We just pump it and use it and we become a little wasteful. Though initially it served a good purpose because when no water was available to drink, it got you water to drink. But if you'd stopped with that, it would have been fine. But because after that in places which grew one crop a year, which was a rain fed crop, you started growing crops in uh, Punjab, which is otherwise a wheat growing drier area, irrigated with river water, they dug bore wells and they started growing rice. And that's not a place where you'd grow rice. You grow rice in West Bengal or in uh, southern parts where areas are naturally inundated. So many times, tech, the moment you crack desalination and you bring costs down, people will start desalinating the hell out of the oceans and kind of using it for all kinds of purposes. So that's really the challenge about how do you regulate and how do you still keep your demands low. Thanks everyone.